Hi everyone, I'm going to be talking about Taylor series today. I'm uh, the TA for a Calc 2, uh, a couple of sections for a Calc 2 class, and so I'm making this largely for my students who, who might want to watch this as a way to review, but um, also for anybody else who's interested in uh, learning a little bit more or reviewing a little bit about Taylor series. So the goal of Taylor series is to represent a function as a power series. Let's see. We want to represent a function that's, uh, my writing is a little sloppy there. That's alright. Represent a function as a power series. And I'll explain in a second what I mean by that. First, we're going to start with this uh, formula. Um, let's see. If r if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of r to the n is going to be 1 over 1 minus r. Okay, so uh, if, just a, a refresher on that. The reason this is true is because if we think about that sum right there, what does that mean? The sum from n equals 0 to infinity of r to the n is going to be 1, when n equals 0, r to the 0 is 1, plus r, plus r squared, plus r cubed, and so on. And let's suppose that this thing converges. It will converge if r is less than 1. And I, I suppose we can show that as well. We may as well do that. Um, let, let's suppose we're interested in, in the sequence of partial sums. So f sub n is going to be 1 plus r plus r squared plus all the way up to r to the n and then we stop that that's just a partial sum and let's see here let's suppose we multiply s sub n by r so r times s sub n is going to be let's see this one becomes r and this r becomes r squared when we multiply by r and then we have plus r cubed plus and this r is going to become r to the n plus 1. But of course, before that, we'll have an r to the n term. And here we'll have an r cubed term and, and so on. Right? Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to subtract uh, r s sub n from s sub n. So we're going to take s sub n minus r s sub n, and where s sub n is the partial sum up to n, and then we stop there. And that's just going to be, uh, let's see, this 1, nothing's going to happen to that 1, and then, but this r is going to cancel. Let's see, this r cancels with that r. This r squared is going to cancel with that r squared, and so on. We're going to have a bunch of cancellation, you know, all the way down, until this r to the n cancels with this r to the n, and then we're left with, let's see, the only things we were left with were the 1 and the r to the n plus 1. There we go. Uh, but we're subtracting this part, so we have 1 minus r to the n plus 1. And uh, let's see, let's go ahead and, and finish this out. So we've got s sub n times 1 minus r is equal to 1 minus r to the n plus 1. And so then s sub n equals 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. Now... The, the series is actually the limit of the partial sums, and it's easy to show that the limit as n goes to infinity of s sub n is just going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of this thing. And it's easy to show that that is 1 over 1 minus r. So if r is less than 0, uh, so, so this part right here is where we use the fact that r is less than 0 or sorry, that the, less than 1. The absolute value of r is less than 1. Because if, if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then raising it to a really big power is going to make it really, really close to 0. And then everything else is going to stay the same as n gets big. So we're essentially going to have 1 minus 0 over 1 minus r. And that's why, as long as the absolute value of r is less than 1, this is going to hold. Which is a really cool fact. So we've got this fact that if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the sum um, as 
as we go from 0 to infinity is just 1 over 1 minus r. So we have a nice little formula for this infinite sum. And if we have that, that allows us to say, let's suppose we're looking at a function. I'll go back to black. Let's suppose we're looking at a function like 1 over 1 minus x. Well, then we can rewrite that function as long as x, as long as the absolute value of x is less than 1, we can rewrite that function as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n, which is kind of cool. In fact, we, we can play some more games with this. We can say, um, let's see, we can say f of x, let's suppose I just said f of x equals 1 over x. Let's see what happens here. I can represent this thing as 1 over 1 minus 1 minus x. Let's see, check and make sure that's true. Yeah, that's true. And then I can go ahead and rewrite that, if I want to, as an infinite series. So the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 minus x to the n. That's pretty cool. So we can do this with a lot of functions, and there are a lot of uses for doing this. Uh, sometimes uh, it will help us to integrate things because we can integrate term by term. That's just one use. There are other other reasons we might want to do this. Um, we can uh, use uh, we we can use these sorts of functions to study these things, and vice versa. We can use the the series to study the, the behavior of this thing. Maybe get some good approximations to it. Who knows? Uh, we can use these this sort of thing for all kinds of purposes, but sometimes it's not super easy to write things as 1 over 1 minus something. And so the question that Taylor series tries to answer is what about general, or at least a little bit more general, functions f of x? Maybe, maybe it's not a nice function that you can turn into this and do some magic with, with geometric series. So how can we solve that sort of problem? Well, the, the, the goal of Taylor series is to try to find an answer to that. And let's just take any old function. Let's just say f of x. Should I say f of x? Yeah, we'll, we'll just pick a, a general function f of x. And let's suppose the idea is to suppose that f of x can be written as a as a power series. And we're not saying that every function can be written as a power series, although you'd be surprised at how many can. We're just saying let's suppose that a function can be written as a power series. Then we want to sort of figure out what that power series would look like. Well, we know that it's going to be, we know it's going to have some constant term, it's going to have something times x, it's going to have something times x squared. So we'll go ahead and call those a sub 0, a sub 1, and a sub 2, just to, to kind of keep track of those things. Uh, and, and it's going to, you know, go all the way down, a sub 3, x cubed, and so on. So we're just supposing that this is possible, and we'll, we're going to try to figure out Try to figure out what we can say about what these things are that we're multiplying by x, by x squared, by x cubed. So what can we say about the a, let's, let's say the a sub k, a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, and so on. What can we say about them? That's what we want to do. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through a nice little argument. Let me make that small and kind of put that. Oops. Whoa. Not that small. I'm just going to kind of shove this over to the side for a second here. So try to figure out what we can say about the AKs. I don't know if you can still read that, but that's okay. Okay. So um, let's look at the derivative of X prime of x, that's going to be 
let's see, the A0 is going to drop away, and the A1, that X will drop off of it. We'll just have A1 plus 2 times A sub 2X plus 3 times A sub 3X squared. And let's see, what happens then? Oh, you know what? Actually, before before we do that, let's try to figure out what f of um, what what a naught is. Okay, if we're gonna get rid of that a naught before we do that, we should figure out what a naught is. Well, what is f of? Uh, let's see. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I'm gonna divide the screen a little bit, and we'll try to figure out what is f of zero. And this will help me figure out what a naught is. Why is that? Well, if I plug in 0 for x, then all of these terms are going to be 0, right? We have an x there, so that's going to be 0. We have an x squared, so that'll be 0. We have an x cubed, so that'll be 0. So all of these terms will be 0 if I plug in a 0 for my x. Okay, so f of 0 is just going to be a naught. It's going to be this term right here because everything else is going to be 0. All right. Now I'm going to do something similar with my uh, with my f prime. See what it, f prime of zero is also go, is going to have to be a one, a sub one, because if we evaluate this at zero, we let x be zero, then we have two a two times zero, and we have three a sub three times zero squared, and we'll have four uh, a sub four times zero to the third. And everything else from then on will be zero, and we'll just have this a1 remaining. So that's how we know that uh, this f prime of zero, which is which means you take the derivative and you evaluate it at zero, that's going to be my a sub one. Okay. Well, let's continue on. Let's take the second derivative now. So f double prime of x. What's going to happen now? Well, my a sub 1 is going to drop out. I'll have 2 a sub 2, uh, and that x will, will kind of leave. Uh, and then I'll have 3 a sub 3x squared, except I'm taking the derivative, so I'll, I'll bring that 2 down. And then I'll just have uh, 3 times 2 times a sub 2 times x. I know I could multiply these and make it 6, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to leave it as 3 times 2. And then let's see, over here, what's the next term going to be? Well, it was going to be 4a sub 4x to the 5th, I believe. No, 4a sub 4x to the 3rd. So now it'll be 4 times 3 times a sub 4x to the x squared. And we'll keep going from there. Now, if I were to evaluate this at 0, f double prime evaluated at 0 is going to be 2 times a sub 2. And notice that I'm able to figure out what a sub 0, a sub 1, and a sub 2 are just by looking at my derivatives and evaluating it at 0. Right? Because I can just divide by 2 uh, here to get my a sub 2. And these I don't even need to divide by anything. I just have them. Alright. So uh, let's take my derivative a couple more times just for fun. I think we're getting on a roll here. Uh, this 2a sub 2 is going to drop. I'll end up with 3 times 2 times a sub 2. My x uh, goes away. I just have the constant. And then I have my 4. Let's see. I'm going to have a 4 times 3. And then I pull this 2 down. So I have 4 times 3 times 2. a sub 4 x. And then my next term is going to be, well, it should be, a, let's see. I was going to have a, a 5 times 4 a sub 5 x to the fourth, sorry, x cubed. Now I'll have a 5, that'll turn into a 5 times 4 times 3, a sub 5 x squared, and so on. What you can see here, hopefully, what, I, what I'm hoping you'll see is that uh, what I'm doing is I'm just, uh, I'm getting factorials here in the long run. By the time I uh, get all the way to where it's a constant, here I'll have, I've multiplied this uh, x to the fourth term by 3, I've multiplied it by 2 now, I've, I multiplied it by 4 up, up earlier here when I had plus uh, 4 a sub 4 x cubed, and I multiply it by 3 and then there's going to be a 2 there, so I multiply it by 2 and then there's a 1 there, so I just kind of leave it the way it is, 
that's going to happen with every term. If I have, uh, um, well, that, that's going to happen with every term, and so f, uh, and so I, I can start to see a general pattern here, maybe. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and look here at what comes next. So f triple prime evaluated at zero. All of these terms with x's in them again are going to go away. Now I have three times two times a sub two. Three times two. Is that an a sub two? Oh no, that should be an a sub three, shouldn't it? Yeah, I had a two here. I have a three here and a four here. So that should be a three. Three times two times a sub three. Take the derivative a couple more times, and hopefully we'll we'll have the idea here. Maybe just one more time, and then we'll try to do the general case. So the fourth derivative, this constant term drops, and we have 4 times 3 times 2 times a sub 4. We don't worry about that x anymore. And then we have plus 5 times 4 times 3. And then this 2 is going to swing down. That 2 that was in the exponent, we'll have times 2. We've got a sub 5x. And then we keep going after that. Okay. Well, the fourth derivative evaluated at zero. Everything again with an x is going to be zero. So we just have the fourth derivative evaluated at zero is going to be four times three times two times a sub four. And we can start to look at these uh, terms here and maybe see a pattern. Well, we've already sort of been talking about that pattern, but the pattern is. Uh, first we have a naught, then for the first derivative we'll have a 1, okay, the second derivative will have a 2, third derivative will have a 3, okay, that's a pattern, but then the other thing you should notice is that for the second derivative we multiply by 2, for the third derivative we multiply by 3 times 2, for the fourth derivative we multiply by 4 times 3 times 2, for the fifth derivative we multiply by four, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And in fact, we can go ahead and, and make sure this is true in general. That the uh, if if the nth derivative oh how do we do this let's see well let, let, let's actually just uh, let, let's go ahead and state that it looks like the nth derivative evaluated at zero is going to have to be it's going to be n times n minus one times n minus two all the way down to one in other words it's going to be n factorial times a sub n. So, drum roll, what is a sub n? Well, then a sub n equals the nth derivative evaluated at zero divided by n factorial. That's, that's what a sub n is going to have to be in order for a power series to work. So we can conclude Therefore, if f of x is equal to, let's see, if f of x is equal to some sort of sum, a sub 0 plus a 1x plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub 3, x cubed, and so on, if that's the case, then a sub n is going to have to be the nth derivative of f evaluated at 0 divided by n factorial, at least if this is true around 0. So if this is true in a neighborhood of 0, I suppose I could specify. if that's true in a neighborhood of zero. And what I mean is sometimes we might end up with a series that doesn't converge for x equals zero. But as long as it converges for x equals zero, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to look like this. The nth derivative of zero over n factorial times x to the n. And I suppose, I suppose if we write it out in this form, it will, it will be in a neighborhood of zero. So, so we can go ahead and and say this with, with confidence. If if this is the case, then this is going to have to be the form of a sub n. There's no other option. Which means, that tells us, by the way, that can tell us some interesting information. That if we want to know the uh, the nth derivative of, of 1 over x evaluated at 
n uh, at zero? Well, <laughs> that doesn't make much sense because we can't evaluate it at zero, so so never mind. Um, let, let's suppose we want the nth derivative of one over one minus x evaluated at zero. That's just going to be. It's going to have to be n factorial, I believe, because if f of x looks like this, then this is what a sub n has to be. So in this case, in the case 1 over 1 minus x, we have a sub n equals 1. So this is sort of an example, I suppose. In the case where f of x equals 1 over 1 minus x, we know that that's the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of just plain x to the n. So a sub n equals 1 for all n. So the nth derivative of f evaluated at 0 divided by n factorial is 1 for all n. So if you're interested in knowing what the nth derivative uh, of 1 over 1 minus x is, if you evaluate it at 0, it's going to have to be n factorial. So so you, you might see this on a, on a homework, or maybe not homework, but a test problem. Look at uh, 1 over 1 minus x. What's the 15th derivative evaluated at 0? And there are two ways you could do that. You could either say, well, let me take 15 derivatives, and then let me plug in 0 for whatever mess I have, and that would take you, you know, the rest of your life. Or you could just say, oh, it's going to have to be 15 factorial because of this reason right here. That's kind of cool. All right, all right. So that's the idea of Taylor series. Let, let me just kind of write our, our general conclusion again. Well, I guess I have it, I have it right here. If if we have a series, this is actually a Maclaurin series. Whoops. Uh, this is Maclaurin series, which means Taylor series centered at zero. With Taylor series in general, we can get a little bit more general, and we can center it at a. But but it's always nice to start out with centering things at zero. And the argument for the general case is, is pretty pretty similar. Just a sort of straightforward extension of this. So this is a Taylor series. This is the idea, and uh, that's what we're trying to uh, do in this class right now. It's a pretty cool. It's one of the highlights of the Calculus 2 course, although if you're in the course right now, you might feel a little bit, uh, I don't know, stuck in the mire, and you might feel like, why is this a highlight? This is a tor this is torture, but it's it's one of the kind of uh, big results, I guess we could say, of the calculus two course that we've sort of been building toward, and maybe now you can see how. All right, thanks for watching.